doing this. Uh, did it say when this was going to be? But I don't have y'all on the schedule yet, I don't think. There, this is a project that's going on in Carl in two or three years. No, I mean, this, they've been to three counties already and they're coming to Carl's for Friday. But it's a deal. Johnson, she said if anybody had anything, they could work it out. That's where she asked me to bring them down here. If anybody she wanted to bring them to Clarksville, you yeah, said? Yeah, okay. But they will come to every county. I think they're coming down They may be coming down here, but she just asked uh, me to pass them down. Okay. Anybody that might. So. You never know. Somebody might right. move away or something wonder, like that. So. I wonder if they have uh, this paperwork at the rubbish shop. They went on the list, and so that was the reason she just said that they might have to to me to do that. That's how they can do it. There are also a certain amount of preservation material will be given to this person. You know, if you were to bring, let's say, an old, old letter or something in, just negative, you know, then they'll give you the proper form or not forms, but materials to encapsulate that. They will keep it from deteriorating and give you some advice that they're going to be giving. And I, I don't know to what extent they're giving, just how much they're giving away to the person bringing it in to help them be served. Mm -hmm. So does anybody want on these forms? Georgia does. Yeah, Joe. Oh, it's several days. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs>
so-and-so that you might be willing, if you would speak to them first to see if they would even be interested in being approached, that would be greatly appreciated instead of like a cold call, so to speak. All right, and if you could give us their contact information, and um, because we want them to understand that when they, if they're willing to loan an item, there are different types of loan. Just because you loan it doesn't mean you lose it forever. I mean, they can put stipulations on it, and we'd be more than happy to accommodate what those stipulations are. So if you can, if you have you can brainstorm, if you have anyone in mind, and and also, and I, and I, I hope this doesn't end, but we. What might be to someone is relevant, may not be. And so we really want to weed through that process because we don't have room for storage of items that you know we, we cannot use. Right? So if you keep us in mind, it would be great. Okay. Something like that. That cannot be replaced. 
and it's it's been a uh, built ramp of just houses and top of houses around it, and it's all features in Mill Road. So if anybody's interested in supporting that or working with them on that, or looking at alternative ways for them to put a corridor someplace else, uh, or you know, in a different route, and uh, then see me, and I'll be glad to. The computer this morning said that they have deferred it to a later date. They have so deferred a one-year moratorium. Um, anything they nobody can build, sell, yes, anything for you. Yes, and but they're going to have another reading, I think, in August, around the first of August. And she, when we were there, she said that uh, they they only gave them 25, 24 hours notice, and that was the day we were supposed to be there on Friday. And she's getting ready for us, you know, to come. So, the two other farms in the area yes. have very very same people. to be preserved and it does not live in that type of environment. The brick house was built in 1852 and it uh, was mortared with um, lime and sand and they're afraid that if they start blasting around there it will come down. Well, it's, it's certainly something that, that we all should be interested in, uh, seeing that it's preserved in some way. Now this is not talking about the house that Greg had. 
house, but it was it was the house that was right there next door. And, uh, and uh, because that was where Val Wilford and Jackson lived, in the house next door. And um, so anyway, we just found it interesting that it came out, but Jim found it in some of these publications, and this was a, a letter, and he was 12 years old during the Civil War. So they, that was our great, great, great grandparents' uh, house, and he's talking about what came in. And it's always exciting when you find something in print. I know oh, it is. to know our family history. Oh, yes. Okay. So what other guests do we have besides our Houston County guests? Oh, Linda? No. She's mom. <laughs> what is it? Oh, no, we were there. Could you come And then Jim Wall. And, and Jim is, oh, this is Jim from the archive. This, this, is, the archive. this is the man. <laughs> he, he knows everything. I, I, I hear about it. And he knows it all, and he's smart as a whip. Did you just call me a know-it-all? Did you just call me a know-it-all?
She's already she's already left.
ain't no sure sign it's so. Because everybody has their own interpretations of what they have heard, what they read, and what they think they know. In fact, I've been relating this story to Bell Witch for about 40 years plus. That's the White House calling. <laughs> and one night, my wife and I were going home from a presentation. And I said, you know, honey, I believe I'd better look over those books we have on the Bell Witch again because I'm varying so far away from the story. I believe we're getting away from the truth. There is no guaranteed, absolute, single column of truth about the Bell Witch story. It's an example of folklore which is believed sincerely in the minds of those who've heard Pappy and Mammy and Grandmammy and Grandpappy talk about it and believe it so. And if you choose that, go right ahead. But in this fellow's judgment, the good Lord who made us determined it wise for us not to know everything. And that's Amen. one reason why he gave us a sense of humor. Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> relating this Belvedere story got started on this fellow's part and relating it to high school juniors. Yes, back in the 60s before you were even thought of. <laughs> and the discovery was made that here was an example of history in our immediate part of the country that young folks had heard about, wanted to know more about, and he kept them awake. And of course, relating that story, being the prankster that this fellow is, we've had some real funny things happen. I'll tell you one story, and then we'll get on with the Bellwood story. You know, in every group, there's at least one who is very gullible. <laughs> and I'm looking over the crowd right now, just trying to decide which one it's going to be. <laughs> and there was once a student teacher with us, and he asked if he couldn't be a part of the storytelling. And I said, yes, you've got a cat. I like cats, but... You bring that cat to class. And there was a window in the door. He was in the hall with the cat. And we had worked out the sign language for me to let him know. <clears throat> well, that's the governor's office. <laughs> <laughs> or the state historical side. I was going to let him know when the time was right for him to open the door and let the cat come in. And so I gave him the sign. He opened the door. The entire class was glued on the storyteller. It was a cloudy day and raining, and the lights were out. So the atmosphere was pretty good. The cat came into the room, looking over the students that didn't notice the cat. And it made a left-hand directional turn signal and started down the center aisle of the classroom. Headed right toward the most yellow everything, okay? <laughs> Seizing the moment, the storyteller sidetracked and said to the class, What in the world would you think? If all of a sudden you would experience the sensation of something rubbing against your leg. <laughs> and about that time, that cat brushed against her leg. She pole vaulted into her hair, cursed the teacher. And I'm not sure about what may have suffered some kidney problems. <laughs> now, it didn't take many moments like that for the reputation to get around. You don't need a radio or a television or a newspaper or that, whatever you call that thing you've got on your hip. All you need is another person with ears. You just make sure your story is juicy enough and tell it. How many of you? have lived on an eight-party telephone line. <laughs> the rest of them are culturally deprived. <laughs> They've missed a whole lot. So, here we go with the story. It was the early part of the 19th century, as Teresa personally remembers it, that our part of the country was caught up in a great wave of migration from the East Coast. That was certainly true here in Stewart County. 
with your ancestors and mine. And among the people who came was a family by the name of Bell. John, his wife Lucy Williams Bell, and their dear children. It was obvious they didn't know about birth control. <laughs> and they came out of the Yadkin Valley of North Carolina, not too far from Winston-Salem, and settled on a farm bordering the Red River in Robertson County. Well, they built a big log house, just like those built here in Stewart. Double logs, breezeway through the middle, stone chimneys on each end to chase away the winter's chills. Maybe an L added to the back. And there they settled down to live. Now as the years rolled by, the Bells developed a very enviable reputation in Robertson County. First of all, they were Baptists. <laughs> I'm sure if I were to take a poll, the vast majority of them would be Baptists. Not an unusual 
sound at all. They pass it off as the moaning of the wind around the corner of the house. And at times it's so soft. And at other times, without any warning, it becomes really? You never know from one minute to the next what's going to happen, okay? <laughs> Maybe I better get a little closer. <laughs> so, so the boys lay there for a moment, just puzzled by the sound, and finally summing up their courage, they threw back the kippers, stepped out on that cold plank floor. Some of you know what it was like to step out on a cold floor or a linoleum floor, it could be colder. And they went to the window and raised the sash to look outside, and as they did, they were shocked in amazement <laughs> as they were real cold. Not to. Not to that shock. Worse than that, since they thought they'd heard the limbs of nearby trees scrape against the logs on the outside of the house, there were no limbs nearby to scrape them. Well, the boys went back to bed this time. They pulled the kids up just a little bit higher because they're getting scared. You know, when you're scared, you're a little more afraid than when you're scared. <laughs> and then the cover on top of these boys, without any forewarning of what was going to happen. We're shaking off on the floor. Now there's no heat in the room. And the boy on the side of the bed had the kids to fall into the floor, leaning down to pick them up to pull them back up on the bed. And how did he do that? Very carefully. And as he began pulling the kids back up on the bed, all of a sudden, he felt the pulling or tugging sensation at the other end of the kids. Now it's not likely you and I are going to sleep under much cover tonight. But the first cold night that comes, you remember tonight, and those kivers on top of you, in case you notice a slight movement of them without you moving them, don't call your speaker. <laughs> well, the next thing you know, Mr. Ingram tells us that the boys realized that there was something falling down to the chimney in their room, no fire in that fireplace, and objects were rolling out across the floor. And the boys both got right and looked out on the floor by the light of the moon, that same one we may see tonight, revealed fresh fruit direct from Walmart rolling out the floor. <laughs> they got up and examined the fruit and found it fresh, but a little hesitant to try it. But back to the bed they went and one perchance said to the other, I wonder if anything unusual is happening to sis, their sister, across the they didn't have to wait long to find out about their sister. Remember, this is happening. How far is it from here? Adam says the crow flies. 25, 30 miles? Mm -hmm. 42, 43 miles. All right, now I'm talking about something, young folks, that happened really deep. Not more than 40 miles from the spot you're keeping warm right now. Nearly 200 years ago. And so the boys lying there in bed wondering about their sister. From the direction of her room, without any warning, came this blood curling yell out of the boys found it, and across the hall in the Betsy's room to see what the boys were going on. As they got into her room, the light of the moon, the same moon you just have one of them, <coughs> shining through the window, revealed her sitting upright in bed, her head in a tremble, a terrible convulsion. And as they got to her bedside, they found clumps of her hair. You wouldn't be glad you're that far away. <laughs> then it had been pulled out of her scalp and lying on the pillow behind her. Now, ain't that weird? Well, she just suffered this awful pain. And there was the hair to prove something. Some force had pulled the hair out of her back. <coughs> well, but now Mom called her upstairs to see what the world their young folks were up to. And they were just as puzzled as the children. And imagining the typical nature of parents that console their teenagers and urge them to go back to bed and go to sleep. Like they did, I wage with you one I hope just for good measure. The next morning, pond boys went to the lot to feed the stock while mom and sis were fixing breakfast. I always get so amused at people talking about making breakfast. I never ate any made breakfast. 
breakfast in my life in the year it's fixed. Isn't that what you said? And so a pod of boys are walking up the road corn stubble where they picked corn by hand on the way to the lot to feed. And they weren't poking long because it's cold. I was ahead of the boys. He raised a foot to take a step as normal as anyone would take a step. When an invisible force, I'm aware of that glass of water. <laughs> <laughs>
her if she knows how to work grandpa. <laughs> Some of you are grandpa who fall victim to that. <laughs> and so this new found visitor, they named Caleb, walked over to old John Bell, looked up at him in the face and said, You'll never come to kill you. That didn't bother John Bell. How many of you had a cat to tell you it was going to kill you? <laughs> And then as the story continues, the spirit, Kate, walked over and Betsy and in a very unkind voice said, they tell me you're in love with the school teacher in this neighborhood and had the nerve to name me. Now I know gossip swarms around the Dover and Street County. Because it does. Well, it's not what I'm counting. But sometimes you're kind of slow about naming names, aren't you? <laughs> a little while. Maybe about that long. And the spirit says to him, you're in love with Josh Martin, the school teacher. Well, John Bell says to the family after her, revelation of all of this, you must keep it all quiet. Do not reveal to anybody in this neighborhood about what's going on. I usually say up in Hoptown uh, that if uh, you're allowed to start talking in all of these strange angles of Riddles that there is a mental institution nearby <laughs> and to, to which you might be taken. So the family kept it quiet. But what about Josh Gardner, the young school teacher who was courting Betsy? And he would come on Sunday afternoons or maybe on Saturday night and they would sit in front of the fire. Now listen to this, young folks. Courting in those days consisted of the fellow calling on the girl at her parents' home and sitting there and talking to her in the presence of her parents and all the rest of the children. That's what they tell me is the source of how sweet nothing's got to start. <laughs> Just heavy breathing. <laughs> well, one night Josh was there courting Betsy in this black cat. Something just a little bit more than that school teacher can stand. So he said, Feats, do your thing. And he left out. <laughs> and you know what he did? All school teachers are black mouths. That's how we make a living talking. And he went out and told everybody the song. Well, that was the biggest news since Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and people in droves came to the bells to see this thing, to be entertained by it. The bells were hospitable people. They invited everyone in who came, but they urged them to don't come out of idle curiosity, but try to help us get rid of the spirit. Because by now, John Bell is suffering the loss of consciousness, followed by about an hour of total weakness that just leaves him wiped out every few days. When Josh Gardner comes to court Betsy, they might be sitting in front of the fire when on one occasion an invisible hand slapped her across the cheek into the middle of next week. <coughs> one day Bates got up and went across the room to do something and fell sprawling on the floor. Josh quickly helped her get up and asked her what was wrong. She responded, I fell over a stick of firewood and there was none there. Now, Betsy's brothers were not exempt either. Come spring, they were plowing. And they happened to plow into an Indian grave. And out of fascination, as we would do today, they exhumed the skull and brought it to the house for the rest of the family to see. And that night after supper, while examining the skull of the family were, Kate appeared and put on the biggest rage of a fit you ever saw about the fact that they had robbed that grave, they desecrated that grave, take that skull back to where they found it, put it there and let it alone, which they did, I'm sure, by the next morning. Now, as the word swept all over Robinson County, the county line was no limit to the spread of that knowledge. And some 30 miles from Adams, there lived a man at a farm he called the Hermitage. The year is about 1818 or 1819. And our beloved president-to-be, Mr. Jackson, was at that time, if my information is correct, the head of the Tennessee militia. And it was his responsibility to go examine this situation.
to prove or disprove the truth of it. And uh, the bell is just a bunch of nuts, as we say to that. <coughs> so Jackson went. You can read the account of it. He was in a cart. And as the cart bearing the future president was within sight of the front gate of the Bell Farm, those cart wheels suddenly locked, locked as tightly as though they had been set in country. The future president stepped from the cart onto the ground when this black cat <clears throat> appeared from the bushes beside the road and began to curse him severely for not believing her. For here's a part of the story that has been left out. Kate was a most versatile, most unusual cat. She could quote scripture. She could sing. She could preach. She could probably give the president some advice on how to plug up the hole.
the weeks rolled into months and the months into years. And this trouble is going on now for upwards of three years. Was there a tiny settlement at Dover in 1820? Maybe a few. Not many. Do you think the people at Dover in 1820 heard about the real witch? Absolutely. No question in the world. Talked about it. Who knows? Some may have even traveled as far as Adams to see if they could see something. Betsy and Josh eventually broke up because of the punishment that was rendered to Betsy when Josh was present, generally. But you know, they couldn't stay apart, so they got back together. Kate came back in her fury, and finally Betsy and Josh broke up. Betsy would eventually move to Mississippi and marry and leave offspring. Joshua Gardner would eventually marry, and there are a number of Gardner descendants in the General Adams neighborhood today. But I have on good authority, having told the story in Adams, now you think it was difficult to tell the story in there. <laughs> but they assured me that to this good night, there's never been a marriage between a Bell and a Gardner. You know how families in a marriage. Gracious me, why don't we have that sense? <laughs> Love and tragedy. 
And just stop and think for a minute. Back in the days of Captain Jack Henson and long before, the people in this county were sitting out on a porch on a hot June night like this, fanning for all they were worth with somebody improvising a story. And then somebody else picked it up and added a little bit more. And then a little bit more. Ain't nothing wrong with it. It's a part of our entertainment before the idiot box came on. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's a part of our culture. Books have been written on the subject. Even a movie, so-called, if you saw it as I did, I was very disappointed because it didn't follow the story that you and I in this neighborhood attached to the village. And I dare say that a hundred, even five hundred years from now, when there's a Stewart County Historic Society, and there will be, they'll be talking about folklore. And it will inevitably include the story of the Bill Witch. So, tonight we're going to be in it. Air conditioners comes up pretty stoutly in the room. It's a little bit chilly. And you pull up the sheet. <laughs> Place your senses in gear to see if you determine some twitching or pulling on the kippers. <laughs> because if you do, you be careful. It may be the Bell Witch. And she may be after you. Thank you. 